Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Flexion Therapeutics First Quarter 2021 Financial Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. We will be facilitating a question and answer session at the end of today's call. If at any time during the call you require assistance, please press star followed by zero, and a coordinator will be happy to assist you. I'll now turn the call over to Scott Young, Flexion's Vice President of Corporate Communications and Investor Relations. Good afternoon. A short while ago, we issued a press release announcing our Q1 2021 financial results. In addition, today we are introducing refreshed metrics to provide increased visibility and insights into the commercial performance of Zoretta. Our earnings press release and the commercial metrics slide can be found under the Investors tab on the company's website, and a replay of this call will be accessible there shortly after its conclusion. Today's discussion will be led by Flexion's Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Michael Clayman, and he's joined by Melissa Lehman, Flexion's Chief Commercial Officer, and David Arkowitz, Flexion's Chief Financial Officer. On today's teleconference, we will be making statements relating to future financial and business performance, market conditions, strategies, and other business matters, including expectations regarding revenue, cash utilization, clinical, regulatory, and commercial developments, and anticipated milestones, which are forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act. These forward-looking statements are subject to various assumptions, risks, and uncertainties, which change over time, and such statements speak only as of the date of this call. Additional information on the factors and risks that could affect Flexion's business, financial conditions, and results of operations are contained in Flexion's filings with the SEC, as well as on Flexion's website. I will now turn the call over to Mike Clayman. Thanks, Scott, and thank you all for joining. In April, we pre-announced preliminary net Zoretta sales of $24.6 million for the first quarter of 2021. And in this afternoon's press release, we confirmed those results and reiterated our full-year net sales guidance of $120 million to $130 million. On today's call, we will provide an update on our commercial progress and walk through the refreshed commercial metrics that Scott mentioned. In addition, I'll share updates on our pipeline programs, and then we will recap our first quarter financial results. However, I would like to first discuss an important personnel update. As you all know, David Arkowitz has capably served as our Chief Financial Officer since May of 2018, and I was truly disappointed when he recently informed me of his decision to leave the company to pursue new opportunities. David has been a key member of our senior management team, and I'm very grateful for all of his contributions throughout the past few years. I know I speak for our entire organization in wishing him continued success as he embarks on a new phase of his career. I'll look to him to share some additional color on his decision when he provides the financial update. While we will miss David's leadership, I'm tremendously pleased to announce that Fred Driscoll will be stepping in as David's successor. Fred was our chief financial officer beginning in 2013, led us through our IPO in 2014, and was at the financial helm at the launch of Zoretta. With that as backdrop, Fred is uniquely qualified for this important role. He possesses an intimate knowledge of our organization and a deep understanding of Zoretta's value proposition, and we are fortunate to have him back. Fred and David will be working together in the coming weeks to ensure a seamless transition. Fred has kindly joined us on the call today, and I would invite him to make a few remarks later in the agenda. Shifting to other recent news, yesterday at the American Academy of Gene and Cell Therapy, or ASGCT, we presented new preliminary data on FX201, our investigational intraarticular gene therapy for the treatment of NEOA pain. While the primary aim of our phase one single ascending dose study is to establish the safety and tolerability of FX201 in low, mid, and high-dose cohorts with five to eight patients in each. 
We are encouraged to see that two patients in the low-dose cohort experience durable improvements in pain extending out to one year post-treatment. As we reported yesterday, FX201 was generally well-tolerated in the initial low-dose cohort. Two patients had self-limited grade 2 index knee adverse events of pain, swelling, and effusion, which were possibly related to treatment and were managed conservatively. In addition to safety and tolerability, we are also investigating exploratory endpoints assessing pain relief using WOMAC-A and functional improvement using COOS tools. At ASGCT, we showed that four of the five patients in the low-dose group reported improvement in WOMAC-A pain scores compared to baseline at weeks 12 and 24. And two of the three patients for whom we have week 52 data were still reporting improvements in pain one year after treatment. Applying validated criteria, a 50% decrease in pain is considered substantial, and two out of the five patients experienced such a response at weeks 8, 12, and 24 following treatment. And one of the three patients who has been on study for at least a year continued to report substantial improvement in pain at week 52. Importantly, all five patients remained in the study at 38 to 56 weeks post-treatment, which is encouraging as it indicates that they have not felt compelled to seek alternative treatments to manage their NEOA pain. As we have previously discussed, our vision for FX201 is that in addition to providing at least 6 to 12 months of pain relief, it will also help improve function. In the low-dose cohort, functional improvement from baseline assessed via COOS was observed in four of the five patients at week 24 and all three of the patients with week 52 data. Preliminary data from the mid- and high-dose cohorts of the single-ascending dose study are anticipated in the second half of 2021. And as we announced in an 8K yesterday morning, one participant in the high-dose cohort experienced gastrointestinal bleeding and atrial fibrillation, which required hospitalization. An adverse event resulting in hospitalization is deemed serious, but the investigator determined this to be unrelated to study drug. As dictated by the protocol, any serious adverse event or SAE, regardless of relatedness, requires a pause in study enrollment followed by a review of the event by the Independent Data Monitoring Committee, or DMC, for the study, and subsequently the FDA. Those reviews were completed as of Tuesday afternoon. Both the DMC and FDA agree with the investigator's assessment and endorse the reinitiation of the trial. Accordingly, we are resuming enrollment. While the data are preliminary, we are encouraged by the results we are seeing, and they support our belief that FX201 holds the potential to provide a differentiated durability of therapeutic effects at the site of disease. We look forward to sharing additional data in the second half of the year, including the evaluation of synovial fluid from patients to assess biological activity of FX201 locally in the joint, which could potentially correlate with clinical endpoints over time. Briefly touching on FX301, our investigational locally administered peripheral nerve block for control of postoperative pain, we continue to enroll patients in our Phase 1B proof of concept trial and remain on track to share preliminary efficacy data later this year. At this point, I'll turn it over to Melissa. Thank you, Mike. Well, it has only been a few weeks since our last update. In that time, we held a virtual national sales meeting where we focused on our strategic priorities and rolled out a number of new supporting tools, all of which was met with great enthusiasm by the entirety of our sales organization. Access to these new tools in conjunction with the return to pre-COVID field travel levels has resulted in a level of focus and excitement that I have to say is unprecedented within my tenure here at Flexion and we believe will serve as an impetus for potentially growing our business in 2021 and beyond, allowing for increasing numbers of patients to experience the impact that Zoretta can have 
in managing their knee OA pain. As we discussed on our last call, we have three strategic priorities. First, positioning and market segmentation. Second, pricing and physician reimbursement. And third, amplification of the patient voice. And I can say that following our recent meeting, our entire commercial organization is hyper-focused on executing against each of them. Regarding our commercial metrics, we've been providing the same metrics for the past several years. Now that we have more than three years in market, we believe that this is the right time to introduce revised commercial metrics that can provide greater and more meaningful visibility into our commercial performance. Historically, we have presented a cumulative view of the ready utilization spanning back to the earliest days of launch. Since comparisons to our early days on market are no longer as relevant as they once were, our revised metrics, among other things, provide views of Zoretta's performance on a more current quarterly basis. At this point, I'll walk through the refreshed metrics that we introduced today. Starting with slide two, we're providing revenue and unit demand for the current versus prior quarter and for the current quarter versus the same period in the prior year. In addition, this dashboard view provides a summary of key metrics and a few highlights, specifically net revenues for the quarter of $24.6 million, and that of the 2,044 accounts that purchased in Q1, 90% had purchased in a prior quarter. With slide three, we've changed the view to provide the last four quarters of net sales versus the previous view, which described quarterly sales going back to launch. As we discussed on our last call, we are pleased with our net sales performance of $24.6 million in Q1, which is particularly encouraging in light of the headwinds that we detailed on that call. On slide four, we're now presenting demand on a quarterly basis. As a reminder, we primarily sell Zoretta to specialty distributors, and we recognize sales upon receipt of products by those distributors. Demand refers to the actual orders placed by accounts, such as physician practices, clinics, and certain medical centers or hospitals with those specialty distributors. From a demand perspective, we were particularly pleased with Q1 performance as demand grew by 6% over Q4 in a period that is typically down in demand by roughly 10% across the intraarticular injection market. In our last slide, number five, we break out purchases by volume and accounts in discrete quarters as a method to more clearly illustrate how our business is moving from quarter to quarter. This view continues to illustrate how practices generally move through the Zoretta adoption continuum from trial to adoption and ultimately to inclusion in standardized treatment protocols for knee OA pain management. This view shows you the total number of units purchased within the quarter in volumes of 1 to 100, 101 to 300, and 301 plus units, as well as the number of accounts purchasing at these volumes within the quarter. In Q1, roughly 38% of Zoretta units were purchased by accounts in quarterly volumes of more than 100 kits versus Q1 2020, when 27% of the Zoretta units came from accounts purchasing in quarterly volumes of greater than 100 kits. Based on historical medical claims data for OAK diagnosed patients who received an IA injection within the 99 accounts that make up our top two purchasing tiers, we estimate the red share in these accounts may be as high as 46%. Our goal with these new metrics was to present them in a way that offered you more discrete performance indicators within and between the quarters versus continuing to look at our business performance cumulatively back to launch. While we believe these provide a more current and instructive view of our progress, we welcome feedback from you and I look forward to sharing our progress against these metrics in the coming quarters. With that, I'll turn it over to David. Thanks, Melissa. As Mike mentioned, Zoretta net sales in the first quarter were 24.6 million, which reflects a gross to net reduction of 18%. This reduction includes rebates to healthcare providers that are variable and based on the volume of product purchased. We reported a net loss of 28.6 million for the first quarter of 2021, compared to a net loss of 36.8 million for the same period of 2020. Cost of sales were 6.1 million and 2.3 million for the three months ended March 31, 2021 and 2020 respectively. Research and development expenses were 14 million 
a 21.1 million for the three months ended March 31, 2021 and 2020 respectively. The decreases in R&D expenses of 7.1 million was primarily due to a decrease of 3.6 million in development expenses for Zoetta due to a reduction in life cycle management activities, a decrease of 2.2 million related to FX201 program costs, largely due to the 2.5 million milestone payment for the first human patient in the phase one clinical trial, which occurred in the first quarter of 2020, as well as the decrease of 3.4 million in salary and other employee-related costs. The decreases were partially offset by an increase of 2.4 million in expenses to FX301 due to the achievement of certain development milestones, specifically the clearing of the IND by the FDA and the initiation of the phase 1B clinical trial, both of which occurred in the first quarter of 2021. Selling general and administrative expenses were 27.6 million and 29.3 million for the three months ended March 31, 2021 and 2020 respectively. Selling expenses were 19.1 million and 20.5 million for the three months ended March 31, 2021 and 2020 respectively. The year over year decrease in selling expenses of 1.4 million was primarily because the majority of industry conferences and physician speaker programs remain virtual due to COVID-19 and although more physician offices are opening, business travel remains low compared to pre-pandemic levels. General and administrative expenses were 8.5 and 8.8 .8 million for the three months ended March 31, 2021 and 2020 respectively. Interest expense was 5.2 and 4.7 million for the three months ended March 31, 2021 and 2020 respectively. We anticipate full year 2021 Zoretta sales in the range of 120 million to 130 million. In addition, we continue to expect that our full year 2021 total operating expenses, including cost of sales, R&D expenses, and SG&A expenses will be in the range of 195 million to 205 million. As of March 31, 2021, we had 154.3 million in cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities compared with 175.3 million as of December 31, 2020. Based on our current operating plan, we believe that our current cash balance is sufficient to fund our operations into at least mid-2022. In closing, I'd like to share some perspectives on my time at Flexion. It has been a privilege to work with Mike and the other members of the management team. I know that the departure of any CFO is always a notable event, but let me state unequivocally, it is in no way a reflection of the confidence I have in this team, Zoretta, or the prospects reflection as a whole. While I had no interest in leaving, I was presented with a rare opportunity, one that will allow me to more fully utilize my strengths and which expands my scope of responsibilities. Flexion is an amazing organization that is making a real difference in the lives of patients. And while I will have a different vantage point, I look forward to watching its continued success in the years to come. With that, I'll turn it back to Mike. Thank you, David, and thank you for all of your hard work over the past few years. We have made tremendous progress during your tenure, and we deeply appreciate all that you have done. While David's tenure is coming to a close, a new chapter in Fred Driscoll's career at Flexion is just beginning. And to this point, I would invite Fred to make a few remarks. Fred? Thanks, Mike. It's a real pleasure to be on the call today, and I'm extremely excited to be rejoining the company. Since my retirement, I have been closely following Flexion's progress, Zoretta's ramp, and the addition of two potentially transformative pipeline drug candidates. In the last few years, the company has evolved into a significant player in the musculoskeletal space, and the importance of its mission and the impact of Zoretta has only grown. I share David's view of Flexion's future. I firmly believe that with this product, its winning commercial strategy, and the passionate people who make Flexion such a remarkable organization, the opportunity ahead of us is tremendous, and I am thrilled to be back. Thanks, Fred, 
and welcome back. Before I hand it over to the operator for Q&A, I would briefly summarize the first quarter as one of progress, building momentum, and optimism about the improvements we are seeing across the nation. As Melissa mentioned, the energy in the field is at an all-time high. Our confidence in Zoretta's potential has never been greater. Our pipeline continues to advance, and we have a tremendous management team in place. Those are all the ingredients needed for a very bright future, and I know that each and every individual inflection is committed to realizing it. Thank you. At this point, I would ask the operator to open up the line for Q&A. Thank you. To ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Once again, that's star 1 on your touchdown telephone to ask a question. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. To ensure there is adequate time to get to everyone, participants are asked to limit themselves to two questions. If you have additional questions, please rejoin the queue, and we will come back to you as time permits. Thank you. Our first question comes from the line of Elliot Wilbur of Raymond James. Your line is open. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, first question from Mike, just a point of clarification on the 201 study protocol. Um, does any SAE trigger a stoppage of the trial and, and review by the, the uh, DSMC or just certain events? Um, Elliot, the simple answer is, is yes. Any SAE, this is the first time um, this vector had been injected into the knee joint out of an abundance of caution, the FDA really strongly pushed in that direction because sometimes determinations of relatedness by investigators might get called into question uh, by after subsequent review. And in this case, um, we were asked to take what I'll call a belt and suspenders uh, approach. So any SAE would have triggered the cascade um, that was seen with this SAE. Study pause, investigator determination, study pause, DMC review, FDA ultimately green light. Uh, that's how it worked out this time. Um, and and uh, it would be the case for anything. That is an SAE. Okay. And now that um, the initial data has has been presented, can you just maybe – Describe for us some of the, you know, feedback, perspectives that you've received within the, the clinical community and maybe some of the uh, important takeaways and, 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 and subtleties that maybe just aren't so uh, obvious uh, uh, in, in the poster or abstract itself. Yeah, Elliot, I would say this. Um, there's tremendous enthusiasm um, in many circles for the potential for FX201. The data that we presented at um, ASGCT was the low-dose cohort. It's still preliminary. It's not fully mature. And I think that um, people are looking to see not only what we have with the low-dose cohort, which has some promise in it as, as delineated, uh, and we went through that in this um, script, but also to see what happens with the mid- and high-dose cohort, especially over time. So I think it's, it's just early um, I think there, there are a lot of people who are keenly interested in this um, gene therapy approach and this specific vector and are hungry for additional data, and we're eager to share that all those data at the right time. Okay. Just a last question here. Understand there's only um, sample size of, of, of five, uh, so obviously teasing out uh, efficacy data is incredibly difficult, but it just in terms of thinking about the clinical benefit of the product, um, I mean, you had two patients that basically, I, I think, responded all the way out to, to 24 weeks, and, and then, um, um, you know, several where we saw, you know, 30% reduction and, you know, 50% reduction for longer periods of time. I guess, how do you yeah. think about sort of what's clinically meaningful here in the context of a reduction from baseline versus the duration of, of effect? Because it seems like there were some yeah. patients where maybe the reduction wasn't as great, but you had benefit out to, oh, I think it was, uh, you know, I can't remember, 38 weeks maybe at the, yeah. the end. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, well, we have to have both. We have to have magnitude effect, um, we, and we have to have durability out to um, our product profiles as meaningful decreases in pain and improvements in function for at least 6 to 12 months. Um, and, and certainly it would have to be at least 30%, and I, uh, frankly, ideally, much closer to 50%. Okay. I'll jump back in the queue. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Madhu Kumar of Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Um, hey, guys. Thanks for taking our question. So thinking about FX201 and the index me AED card, could you give us a little more granularity on, on kind of what happened in those index knees, which patients they were in, as, as much as you can kind of give us a bit of information. And then kind of stepping back from that, what do you think is an acceptable tolerability profile for a knee OA gene therapy drug, given what you've seen yeah. so far, particularly in terms of index knee from the trial? Yeah, well, um, these were adverse events in two out of five patients in a low-dose cohort that played out over the course of days or weeks. They're, as you know, they're grade two, so they were not um, uh, moderate to severe, and um, they resolved with conservative treatment. Um, I think we're going to have to look at what the data tell us to do in terms of um, efficacy balanced by, in this case, um, modest and judged to be tolerable AE. So I think it's really way premature for us to cite chapter and verse on exactly what the equation will look like. Um, clearly, the the more tolerable this product is, the better, um, but everything is benefit risk. And um, if there's extraordinary benefit, um, that would uh, balance out to some extent, some degree of local adverse event, if that should persist. But uh, I don't want to be in the mode of speculating in the absence of the data. Okay, well, to that end, the patients who had the index AEs, were they patients who didn't achieve the 50% reduction? Like, how should we sort out kind of which patients had these AE events as compared to the patients who received Benefit. Yeah, we've not. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Madhu. We've not publicly disclosed that, and that's not something we're prepared to talk about. Um, but we will absolutely be transparent with those data at the right time. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Serge Ballinger of Needham and Company. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Um, I guess my, my first question to, to Mike or Melissa, have you completed other spot surveys with your, your group of uh, orthopedists since we last spoke, um, just to give us an idea of we're seeing uh, improvements in patient volumes uh, in the early part of the, the second quarter? And then second question, just a bookkeeping one for, for David. Um, since you've uh, restarted manufacturing in the fourth quarter, are we now reaching steady state levels of, uh, uh, of COGS, or should we still uh, expect to see some variability in the second quarter? Thanks. Melissa, do you want to take that first question? Sure. Yep, I can take the first one. So the last time that we checked in on patient flows to practices was uh, near the end of February, and we – have heard no change um, in some one-off conversations with practices as well as with our field leadership team that, you know, patient flows remain um, at around 80% of pre-COVID levels. And when we did that check-in back in February, um, we also asked the panel of 30 or so orthopedists how long they expected that to remain, and they had said they thought it would carry through to at least um, the middle part of this year. Yeah, hey, Serge, it's, it's David on, on your question about uh, COGS. Um, so as I had said previously, um, we, are, we were expecting to uh, get back to kind of normalized pre-COVID gross margin percentage um, levels this year. First quarter, 
gross margin percentage was 75 percent, a bit lower than what we uh, what we'd anticipated. We expect that to improve during this year, but to continue to have a certain level of inherent um, operational and cost variability as as we are ramping up. Beyond this year, I think that's when we start thinking about steady state um, and getting to uh, a, a target gross margin percentage of around 90%. Thanks. Best of luck, David. Thanks, Serge. Thank you. Our next question comes from Gary Nackman of BMO Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hi, uh, this is Evan Huang filling in for Gary. Um, thanks for taking my question. Uh, first, um, based on the initial cut of the low-dose data, uh, is there any modifications you're, you, know, you are able to implement for the different other cohorts? for the remainder of the trial. And secondly, for Zareda, um, where are the sales reps now in terms of face-to-face -face interactions with physicians? Uh, is there any modifications you plan on doing either to the sales, sales force or the target physicians? Thanks. So um, I'll answer the first question. Let's obviously will take the second. But just if you would clarify for me, what um, what kinds of modifications are you asking about? Uh, I, I guess in terms of the safety and any ways to – or dosing frequency or um, just any ways. To, yeah, I, I would say better. this. Based on the very um, mild nature of these AEs in the low-dose cohort, um, there would not be a compelling reason to modify the protocol. Um, obviously, what we will do is look at the entire data set, low, mid, and high dose and ensure that we're doing what's right um, for patients and for the product. So um, there is certainly nothing, I can tell you with, with co confidence that there's nothing in this data set that would have pushed us um, to um, consider a modification of protocol. And with regard to the second question around um, the degree to which our sales force is back to face-to-face -face interactions with our customers, um, I would say sort of what I've said previously, which is that across all of our 100 or so uh, MBM territories, our reps are able to see some percentage of their customers, um, in some cases all of their customers, in some cases 60, 70, 80 percent of their customers um, in terms of face-to-face -face office visits, and that's just based on, you know, what individual practice policies are in the moment um, with regard to um, allowing um, – industry visits to come back. And with regard to the second part of your question around uh, any foreseeable changes to the sales force, we're still um, in the process of synthesizing our findings relative to our optimized footprint. I would, um, I would simply say at this time, we don't anticipate any material changes to the size of our sales organization. Um, more to come on that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Patrick Trichio of H.C. Wainwright. Please go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon, and uh, congrats on all the progress with Silretta and the pipeline. I'm wondering, um, should we think of the regulatory bar for approval of a gene therapy treatment, such as FX201, <clears throat> as being consistent with the updated guidance FDA has provided on disease-modifying OA drugs, and if it is, can you discuss your level of confidence that 201 could demonstrate a benefit on both the pain scores as well as disease modification? And then related to the disease modification, how would you be measuring or evaluating disease modification in the current trial underway or in a larger phase two trial to follow? Um, Pat, thanks very much for, for those questions. They're good questions. I, I think it's fair to say that there is um, – far from clear understanding of what the agency will accept for disease modification. Um, the guidance is pretty high level. And we are um, capturing X-ray and MRI data. But the key thing is to have a validated endpoint from the imaging studies that, that one can hang their hat on that will uh, be endorsed by the FDA. And I'd say that's very much in front of us. 
Um, we are particularly interested in um, durability and magnitude of pain relief and functional improvement. Um, and the, that, if we get at least six to 12 months of that, of meaningful uh, improvements in those domains, that will be enormous. Uh, icing on the cake would be evidence of disease modification. And, and I know you know this, Pat, but I'll just kind of um, point out that patients make the decision to get their knee replaced, patients with advanced OA, which, or patients with advanced pain and, and functional compromise, make the decision to get their knee replaced, not because of an imaging study. Um, they get their, the decision to um, get their knee replaced based on the fact that they can't lead the lives they want to leave, lead and, and have pain that's refractory to available therapeutics. So from our perspective, um, being able to hit on both of those cylinders, pain and function, would um, provide tremendous benefit to patients uh, and have the, the great potential, the potential to um, not uh, have those patients need to make a decision about knee replacement as soon as they might otherwise. Again, this is all in front of us. We have to generate the data, but the logic that hangs together here is around symptom improvement as a prelude to delaying the need to make a decision uh, for total knee replacement. Yep, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. Our next question comes from Francois Brissois of Oppenheimer. Your line is open. Hey, thanks for uh, taking the questions, and uh, best of luck, David, on, on the next um, on the next job. Um, I was just wondering, Melissa, in terms of the new metrics here, uh, is there a particular order, uh, you know, a particular reason for the order that they're presented in? And on slide five, I guess, um, the, you know, purchase accounts, you go 1 to 100, up to 300 and more. Is there kind of a maximum threshold where you think accounts can only purchase a certain amount of units per quarter? Um, no, no intention behind the order of the slides, just kind of thought that, you know, the summary slide up front followed by um, revenue performance and demand performance and then sort of a breakdown of where our demand performance came from seemed logical. Um, and with regard to do we think there's sort of a ceiling on penetration um, at the account level, um, we don't, and certainly, um, certainly there's not one in sight today. I think that even among our highest using customers, we continue to believe that we've, you know, only scratched the surface with the opportunity um, within a given HCP's patient population, but also, you know, across um, a practice's patient population. Okay, great. And then, uh, Mike, in terms of the WOMAC A score, can you just remind us, I think, you know, uh, back a few years ago, uh, so Red had shown some, some, some serious um, Improvement over, you know, over in both in, in all three Womac A, B, and C. So I was just wondering why only uh, show Womac A? Is there a reason here? Well, we were particularly focused on pain and function, and COOS as an instrument actually encompasses um, Womac C, the function domain for Womac, um, and and asks questions beyond that. It's a very it's a instrument that's very familiar to the orthopedic community, um, and we made the decision to use that um, this time around as maybe even a more robust characterization of functional improvement. Okay, great. And then just lastly, in gene therapy, is there, um, you know, sometimes people think about astronomical costs here. Uh, can you just remind us why it might be um, a lot less expensive here for um, OA of the knee? Yeah, I mean, because we're injecting locally and we're asking the vector to produce sufficient protein to achieve a therapeutic concentration in five mLs. I mean, basically uh, a teaspoonful worth of, or uh, about that anyway, a, a very small volume. It, it is, if you compare that to the volume of the intravascular space, the blood volume, and that's about 6,000 mL. So this is three orders of magnitude less. So you can dose down uh, proportionately to achieve the therapeutic concentration in the knee joint. 
And by dosing down, uh, your COGS are less challenging, and that creates pricing latitude that will allow you to charge a price that will be consistent with deriving value um, for um, the product, uh, but will not be astronomical. Okay, great. And would someone, if, if six months durability was shown, why would someone choose Zilretta over this? Is there any reason to, or are they you know, sure. a good problem? There, yeah, it's a, we get asked this a lot, Frank, and I, um, I, I, it's a fair question. But what you get with Zilretta um, is you get um, rely, highly reliable um, pain relief for three months four months. Um, 93% by our own data, 93% of patients respond to Zoretta. That's pretty remarkable. And so for for a person who is entering ski season or is going on a trip somewhere and wants to have that reliable pain relief um, and knows that it's going to kick in within a matter of days, Zoretta will be... In my humble opinion, I expect Zoretta will be the continue to be the tried and true um, therapeutic that will address that need. For someone who um, has different circumstances and wants to um, have a longer uh, pain relief, what we have what we have in front of us is how what the magnitude will be and how durable it will be and how expensive it will be. And all of those factors have to be put together in an equation that uh, patient and physician decide on. But I, I can, given the unmet medical need here, Frank, let's pull way up. Eight million knee injections a year, um, and uh, many, many patients, over a million patients going to total knee replacement a year. The unmet medical need is vast, and the field needs multiple um, effective therapies. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Carl Burns of Northland Capital Management. Your line is open. Great. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on the progress. Um, looking at the demand being up, you know, 6% sequentially over the fourth quarter, um, despite the challenges of COVID and the power outages, extended power outages that is in Texas, and, you know, the, the, the deductible gap that you also get in the first quarter. Do you have any sort of visibility or read into what the pent-up demand of these anomalies might be? Um, thanks. Um, it's a great question. I, I, I don't know that I would characterize it necessarily as pent-up demand. I think it's probably a combination of the reflection of us, you know, being back out there in fuller force, you know, practices, um, you know, catching up with their own patient populations that maybe they've been seen to a lesser degree um, in the quarters preceding Q1. Um, and just, you know, continued improvement with regard to our, our sales effort, you know, our blocking and tackling at the, at the account level. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Daniel Busby of RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hi, everyone. I have a couple questions on the commercial metrics that you disclosed today. Uh, first, if we look at the old commercial metrics, I think around 4,400 total accounts had purchased Zoretta since launch. Um, but if I look at the slides today, only about 2,000 accounts purchased it during the first quarter. Can you help reconcile those two numbers for us? How much of that difference is accounted for by variability in the timing of orders? versus accounts that have tried Zoretta but are no longer using it. Second, it looks like roughly 12.5% of all Zoretta demand in the first quarter came from your top 15 accounts. Is there anything unique or different about those accounts that explains the large order sizes? I'm just trying to tease out whether that's an achievable target for you know, what may be a more typical account. Thank you. Uh, both great questions. So I think the, the difference between what you saw in terms of cumulative accounts purchasing um, to date um, versus the 2044 that purchasing Q1 is 100% what you suggested, which is just a difference in the timing um, within a quarter when an account might make their purchases. And, you know, they may be purchasing based on 
um, when they might have, um, you know, wanting to sort of shore up their access to rebating. It may have more to do with just the way that their patients are flowing. Um, but I, I, I don't think that there is um, anything else that connects or disconnects the total number of cumulative accounts purchasing with um, those that purchased in Q1. With regard to your second question about the percentage of our accounts that purchased in Q1 um, in the top tiers, you know, we actually, you know, we looked at this data a bunch of different ways and got to the conclusion, as I stated in my prepared remarks, that um, among those 99 accounts that comprise uh, the top two tiers of purchasers in the first quarter, you know, our penetration rate, um, you know, could be as high as, you know, 60 plus percent. Um, I think we look at that as a potential model for where we can go with, um, you know, with some more significant proportion of our accounts in the event that we're able to apply the same level of voice and intensity around a broader base of accounts the way that we have with those 99 accounts that today sit in the top two tiers for first quarter purchasing. Okay, and if I could ask a quick follow-up, are those top 99 accounts, do they tend to be larger than your average account? They're, it's really across the board in terms of, you know, the number of docs, the number of patients that they see, the size of the opportunity. Um, there's no sort of unique or set of unique characteristics that tie those those 99 accounts together. Got it. Appreciate the color. Thank you. Our next question comes from Bruce Jackson of the Benchmark Company. Your line is open. Good afternoon, and thanks for taking my questions. Um, so for Melissa, um, a couple of quarters ago, we were talking about the increase in the backlog for total knee replacement surgeries. Um, have you seen any change in that backlog in the market? And with your physician survey, they said things might get to nor back to normal um, middle of this year. How long do you think that the backlog in surgeries might persist? So when we, when we did our last check-in with our panel of orthopedists back in February, we asked about both the resumption of patient flow to practices versus pre-COVID levels. Um, as well as sort of where things stood from the OR standpoint. And they cited in both cases that they were, you know, still living around 80%. So I, I would translate that to mean that we've probably worked through the majority of the backlog of TKA procedures. Um, but certainly as we get above 100, uh, get above 80% in both settings of care, we might expect to see, you know, you know, some dribbling in of upside as, um, as, as we get back to, um, normative levels of TKA procedures as well as more normative levels of patient flow to practices. Okay, and then um, one follow-up, if I could. The, um, the other thing that was discussed a few quarters ago was the ability to access some of the, the high prescribing accounts who had finally had some time to, to evaluate Zilretta. Um, what's the experience been like in those accounts? Are they reordering and are you getting more of the physicians within those practices to start using Zoretto. Yeah, I think I think what you're referring to is the fact that you know during the height of the the pandemic, where physicians were out of their offices and relegated to their home offices and not seeing patients, it gave us the opportunity through remote means to be able to access some HCPs that we maybe previously had had um, a harder time accessing, and I think that. Um, our experience has been that, you know, a not insignificant percentage of those HCPs that we were able to access remotely during that sort of heightened period of the pandemic um, have resulted in, you know, um, some new customers coming on. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to turn the call back over to Mike Clayman for closing remarks. Yeah, I'd like to just thank everybody for their time and attention. Uh, appreciate your support. Uh, we're excited about where we are and what the future holds for us, and we are looking forward to updating you on our progress over time. Be well, everybody. Well, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.